Hello everybody and welcome back to another Spanish Chat. We are into the, I suppose you could say, the second academic year of Spanish Chats. Um, this academic year, uh, unfortunately, they're not going to be as many as last year. Uh, mainly because I'm, uh, I've just started my Masters, I have new management responsibilities, so I'm quite busy. Um, but I will do my best to get them out to you all uh, as much as I can. Uh, for this fun chat, I got to speak to a very special person, Nick Peachy from Peachy Publications. Uh, I'm sure all of you have probably heard of him um, when I was discussing uh, this fun chat with, uh, with my director, Patrick. Um, he was like, oh, Mr. Technology. And so, so I'm sure that's where most of you have probably heard of him from. Uh, his contributions and his insights into using technology uh, or educational technologies in the classroom. Uh, he's very prolific. Uh, in, in, on the internet, and, and is, he, he works on many, many international projects as well. Now, uh, it was really interesting to look at Nick uh, and, and speak about you know, his experiences uh, within language teaching, especially with technology. Um, one thing that really surprised me, I think, was uh, just how long he's been in the industry for and how long technology has actually been playing a role, um, which I thought was interesting. Uh, we also looked at some advice he has for, for EOT professionals in general looking to move into sort of three areas. Uh, one is into teacher training, uh, two is into materials writing, and the third, which we haven't actually, I mean, we've touched on in quite a, a few sponge shots, but not into this much detail, I think. And, and this is freelancing. Uh, and some of the, you might say, pitfalls of, of freelancing are things to, 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 to watch out for. Um, so hopefully you find that very interesting if that's, uh, if that's applicable to you. Um, well, without any further ado, we'll get into it. I hope you do enjoy this one. Uh, please, if you do, don't forget to subscribe, give us a like and comment. Uh, I, I do respond to comments, whether here on LinkedIn or on LinkedIn, um, wherever you guys would like to comment uh, would be amazing. Um, and that's it. I'll see you for the next one soon. Hi Nick, how are you doing? Good. Hi Jim, good to be here on it's, Sponge ELT. Yeah, well, Great. I mean, thank you very much for for taking the time out of uh, of your schedule to be here. Uh, it's a Friday night, so for those watching in the future, it's, it's a mm -hmm. Friday night. So I imagine there could be better things for you to be doing, but but I feel I feel honoured that you're here with me. So we'll <laughs> say that. <laughs> Great. Well, it's great to be here. I mean, it's a pleasure to be asked, and you know, it's always you know good to to get my face out there a bit, especially yeah. in, in these times of sort of constant working from home. You know, to sort of get any any yeah. kind of contact with people is kind of really really a pleasure. Yeah. Well, from what I uh, from our conversations before, you're in the UK, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm in Spain, and so I don't actually get to speak to a lot of people. I haven't spoken to a lot of people in the UK in the last maybe month or so. Has has the situation changed much, or, or are there still many restrictions? How I, I really have no um, idea. Actually, here at the moment, it seems like everything is normal. Ah. You know, you hardly see anyone wearing a mask, um, and you know kids are back to school right. um, I live close to the beach so I go down to the beach and there are people swimming on the beach um, uh -huh. I mean personally myself I, I take a lot of precautions and I'm quite careful but yeah. you know uh, it's especially is this the kind of place people come on holiday to they seem right. to sort of forget all those kind of things when they come on holiday yeah but, yeah. yeah no um, excellent um it's it's very similar here in Spain um everything's kind of back even in the academy we're back to normal Apart mm -hmm. from the fact that um, we have temperature checks, masks, and uh, and hand cleaning, you know, mm -hmm. like crazily. Um, yes. But uh, apart from that, when everyone's outside, it's almost like, well, mm -hmm. it's, there's no pandemic. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> um, right, let's get into, first of all, the purpose. Why are we here? Um, so Sponge Chats actually started uh, a while ago, last year, and they were the response to an email that I received. Uh, and the emails basically asked me, uh, how did I get into teacher training? And uh, it, I, it made me think, and, you know, I've spoken to a lot of other trainers, and now I've spoken to a lot of other EOT professionals in different career paths. And it seems that for, for every person, in, no matter what position they're in, th the career path seems to be quite different. 
um, you know, sometimes vastly different for the same position. And so, and so the purpose of this fun is really to get perspectives from, you know, very successful people in these positions, such as yourself, um, and, and look at how you got there, um, some of the challenges that you faced, and some advice that you have for other EOT professionals looking to make similar moves, so that, so that we can actually hopefully create this perception that, that EOT is an industry that's not closed, it's not just move into teaching and then you're done for the rest of your life. No, mm -hmm. yeah. I, 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 that's because that's not what I see it to be. Um, so I, I suppose if we if we move on from that, then let's let's put the focus on you. And I'm going to start with a, a big question. Uh, who is Nick? Who is Nick Peachy? <laughs> that, that, that is kind of a big question, especially as I get older, that becomes more and more of a complex question to answer. Um, yeah, uh, who is Nick Peachy? I, uh, in terms of what I do nowadays, uh, I spend most of my time um, with doing materials writing, mainly for teacher training. Um, and that's that varies from, you know, I've started my own digital publishing company where I publish my own books and materials, but that's just a kind of small part of my income each month and my time each right. month. The rest of it is spent on, you know, working on different projects as either a consultant or a writer or a developer and developing online courses or face-to-face -face courses for teachers. Right. So, for example, at the moment, I'm working on a, on a MOOC um, for uh, schools in Argentina to help teachers um, become uh, on, uh, online teachers or remote teachers. I'm also working on teacher training course for, you know, the Ministry of Education in Nepal to help to train teachers to use technology and, you know, and so there are always a number of these and, and another project in Venezuela for, for wow. training secondary teachers. So there are all these projects going on and sort of, and, you know, I try and run that alongside sort of developing my own publishing and, you know, and keeping myself up to date and doing social media stuff. So, wow, yeah. this is like there's so many things there. <laughs> You're a very busy man, it seems like. Yeah, but, you know, that's one of the great things, I think, about the pr profession that we work in. And, and like you say, you know, this isn't, you know, being a teacher nowadays doesn't just mean you have to sit in the classroom or stand in the classroom and, and teach. You know, there are lots of other things you can do alongside that. And there are sort of opportunities and, you know, ways of, you know, broadening out your career. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, I'd like to come back to um, some of the points that you mentioned a bit later, uh, looking at, for example, your publishing company, Teacher Publications, and, uh, and how you moved into to being a consultant. Uh, but I'd like to first, perhaps, if we focus on to the two, I suppose, the two strands that you're mainly in, but there's a lot of other stuff that I know. Um, why? So when you moved into teaching or into English language teaching, what was the sort of the, the catalyst for the, the move into, into teach training or the move into materials development? Yeah, initially, well, initially, um, you know, in terms of teaching, I sort of, I started teaching as a music teacher. I, did, I studied a degree in music, and right. um, I started teaching in a prison. Actually, I wow. started teaching guitar in a prison while I was at college doing my my music degree. And that kind of got me into teaching. And then I went off to do a SELTA because, you know, I had this plan of, you know, making some money and then doing a, a master's in composition. And I did SELTA in, in uh, International House in Cairo. And it just blew me away. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, I really wow. enjoyed being in the classroom with, with students and sort of, um, you know, and I really enjoyed the methodology side of it. And it made a huge impact pressure on me so you know I was really keen to get into teacher training as I developed you know I've done my 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 diploma and I sort of uh, at, at that time I moved to Barcelona mm. and you know was working at International House there and you know took over some classes from Scott Thornbury which wow. was an awesome uh, <laughs> step to take and then um, you know and then so sort of there was Celtic, loads of Celtic courses going on there at the time and so sort of I got the chance then to sort of observe Celta trainers and get into doing Celta teaching. Yeah. Uh, at the same at the same time, you know, my first daughter was born, and um, she was she was uh, you know I, I wanted to keep her in touch with sort of her first language culture and things like that. So I bought right. a computer and got some CD-ROMs 
you know, because we, I wasn't internet connected at the time. And, yeah. and one of the CELTA trainers I was observing was uh, doing a master's in educational technology. And I thought, well, that sounds really interesting. I don't know anything about that. So I decided to, to do my master's, which I did with Manchester University. And that got me into the kind of technological side and the materials writing side. Wow. Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, big shoes to fill after Scott Thornbury. Uh, I, oh, I don't I... think I really filled them, but you know, <laughs> just shuffled around in them for a little while. But... It's interesting that, um, you know, you, you said like you, after doing your, your, your SOTA and then you moved into teaching and, and you kind of fell in love with it. And then, then you sort of, uh, you had uh, one, one of the SOTA trainers, like was the, it was the SOTA trainer that was doing the masters in ed tech, right? Yeah. And so that was like a sort of a peer influence on you to say, oh, that's interesting. Uh, so it wasn't yeah. something that you sought out. It was like uh, I, you, it wasn't something that you automatically knew that you wanted to do, which is interesting. No, not at all. No, you know, I'd, it never really crossed my mind before. Then I had this sort of notion of doing a master's because I'd done the the diploma. So I was oh. thinking, what's next? And you know, and I was talking to this guy who was just a visiting. He was a visiting trainer there, and he was mm. talking about you know these ideas of, of you know technology and how it could be used. And we're we're going back to the last century now. We're yeah. talking about tw more than twenty <laughs> years ago. You know, this was in ninety eight, ninety nine, and uh, you know, and he, he sort of made it sound really interesting. And you know, I didn't really feel you know I didn't really feel like sitting down and writing articles about second language acquisition or right. or you know the grammar translation method or something you know I'd had that uh, through my my doing my diploma so I thought wow this is something really new I know nothing about that so you know it would be great to to get into that yeah that's uh that's really interesting um also I imagine you did the diploma when it was you know the the old school hardcore diploma no yes uh, yeah yeah I, I i did it distance and i used to get these packages in brown envelopes you know cool. that that had these folders in that i had to work through and then i'd i'd fax my uh fax. My assignments yes. off to london you know i had to go down the fax office i was in singapore at the time so i had to go down to, to this this office where i could send a fax and fax in my assignments to to ih london to get them marked you know that's so, um i mean even this even the, my, one of my next questions is why the focus on technology and uh, this week i was looking over some of your videos and i i watched one of your webinars i think it was in 2020 um, and it was on um, digital tools for for be for being an, uh, for autonomous teacher training. I think it was called. And mm -hmm. uh, you said that you'd be, you'd be given that talk for probably about, about the last ten years at the time. And and so it's interesting because you know when I think of technology in in education and, and especially in, in language teaching, I think of it as as really as a sort of a new thing, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah. it seems like f for you, you've actually been in the the massive technological changes within the industry for a long time. Um, yeah. Although, you know, to be fair, you know, when I got into it, it wasn't new. You know, right. actually, Cal, it used to be, you know, everybody used to Cal. talk, a, yeah. refer to it as Cal, computer assisted language learning. And, you know, and that goes back to, you know, the 60s, even where there would be sort of, you know, freestanding computers and, and these right. kind of, you know, word word activities and word exercises, you know, and a lot of the things that a lot of companies are trying to do now are still originate back to the back to the ideas that came about in the 60s, you know, of, of having a, you know, a computer that could sort of diagnose your prob any problems with your language difficulties and then give you an appropriate activity, you know, to do with it. That kind of personalised learning journey that we're all talking about these days that AI is helping to produce, you know, that was an idea that, you know, came from way back then. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen there's a there's a video even back in the 50s called about Skinner called the teaching machines. Yeah. And he invented these machines that were looked a bit like typewriters, but they had a roll of paper. And each of the kids sat at this sort of machine with this roll of paper, you know, putting marks on 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 a kind of test sheet as they work through different materials. And he had this idea then, you know, of that you know students could work on these on these things, get immediate feedback from them, and sort of you know uh, 
be, be adjusted, you know, by getting the next activity or being referred back to an old activity. You no, know, these things were going about e even then. So, you no, know, really the, the, you know, the things that we, we're doing with technology aren't absolutely new. Mm. I mean, what's really new is, is this kind of communication across such great distances, right. you know, and it's really sort of connected people to people rather than sort of people to machines or people to content, yeah. uh, which I think is really important change. That's, uh, that's mind blowing uh, to think about um, this idea. In fact, it's funny because I'm, I'm doing my master's at the moment and today we were looking at um, language teaching methods or methodologies from you know, the, the 1700s. And <laughs> we, were, we were looking at you know, the idea that pretty much we just repeat everything again and again and again. And um, it's interesting that, that, that you mentioned that, that you know, these ideas to do with technology were, were, were around in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and, and so, yeah, it makes sense that obviously that, that there's, there's been a, such a focus on that for, su for such a long time. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, I think it was in, in, in this webinar, um, you know, I think someone said that you can't find anything, everything online because you can't speak to people online. And this is where you, you mentioned, um, well, actually we can, because we're doing this right now where we, we mm -hmm. have this element now, is this what you see? So we're going to look at more about your journey in a second, but maybe we just sidetrack for a second. Is this, is this how you see the future of, of tech? within language teaching? Is it more for the teacher training element? And, and, and sort of, is it more than just online lessons? Is it, is it teacher training like this? What, what is the future of tech and, and language teaching? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's all of those things. I mean, the, I, I think, you know, there are going to be, I mean, one of your questions when I read through your questions in advance is how do I see, you know, technology in the classroom? Yeah. And in a way I see it the other way around. I see the classroom in technology, technology right. which is, the, uh, and I think there's going to be more and more of that. And I, I think that's, I mean, partly that process has been speeded up by the pandemic. Right. Uh, but of course, you know, I think that was always going to happen. I spoke to a actually I spoke to a, a school director about a year uh, about a year ago just after the pandemic started and he said to me you know it feels like we've been dragged 10 years into the future right. and I said no actually it's more like we've been dra dragged 10 years into the present because <laughs> you know <laughs> this stuff has been possible for quite a long time but there's been a kind of lot of pushback from schools I think uh, from publishers and from sort of the educational community against doing this. But now we've been forced to, you know, a lot of people, are students, teachers, schools, institutions are saying, hey, this does actually work. We can yeah. do this, you know, and we can do it quite well. And I think particularly for sort of teacher development, it's very useful, you know, very useful tool, you know. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned that you did um, your diploma via distance. I mean, with, with fax machines of all things. Um, I, I did my I did my diploma by distance, obviously in a much uh, easier manner, I suppose. The, you know, we had we had uh, online chats like this, um, and yeah, you know, without that, even now I'm doing my masters by distance, um, and 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 without that, I wouldn't be able to do it. My my my, my teaching situation wouldn't allow me to do it. Which, which, you know, I'm very grateful for. Um, but also, <laughs> you know, the idea of having webinars, your videos that you put out, um, you know, and, and the sharing of, uh, of all the websites. And I, I think I was watching, I, mean, I was reading the other day something from you about different platforms apart from Zoom. You know, it's not just Zoom for the classroom. You know, the, yeah. all of these things out there. Uh, this is, I think this is, this is a, brilliant, a brilliant part of, of, of using the internet, if we will. Yeah. And I think that's something, that, again, you know, has I've seen blossoming through the pandemic, you know, I, I sort of didn't see, you know, there, there, there have been a few people like me knocking around for quite a long while, you know, myself, Russell, Russell Stannard, Pete Sharma, Gavin Dudney, sort of doing these kinds of things. But, you know, since the pandemic, there's been this whole kind of blossoming of much younger people like yourself, you know, doing stuff like that. And that's been one of the really marvelous, you know, it's, it sounds horrible to say it, but that's been one of the really marvelous things about the kind of <laughs> pandemic is that, you know, um, teachers have really kind of, you know, 
r- realize that, that you know they can do this stuff and they can yeah. do it on their own they don't need a big company behind them they don't need you know their, their school to to pay them to do it, they can get out, do their own stuff and become much more independent, you know, whether it's developing themselves or, you know, building up a profile for themselves or, or whatever it is, you know, there are loads of different things you can do. And, uh, yeah. you know, you don't have to necessarily be just employed through a school anymore to, to be able to teach and to be able to generate an income. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Brilliant point. Um, Okay, if we if we shift back to, onto your journey um, through through teaching to teacher training to materials development and to sort of the the amalgamation of everything into what you are now, um, what uh, what what challenges have have popped up along the way? I mean, have there been challenges? I'm gonna I'm going to imagine yes. Yeah, there have been challenges um, in, in in sort of different areas. You know, I think uh, as a a kind of uh, as a teacher and you know working in the ELT profession a lot of those challenges have been on a kind of personal level and right. that you know because there's kind of no you know there aren't really you know there there aren't really clearly defined pathways for sort of development like you said at the beginning you know you can become you become a teacher you can become Uh, an ADOS, you can become a director of studies, you can become a school director, if you like. But, you know, when you go into the sort of materials side of it, materials writing or teacher training, the routes aren't quite so clear. And you can sort of find yourself, you know, having to sort of maybe live off half a salary in order to do Mm. one of those other jobs. You know, it's it's not always that convenient. Or, you know, maybe you have a partner who can sort of, you know, who, who does you know, something that helps to support you, I don't know. But, you know, it can can be very difficult to sort of balance all those things and sort of maintain a life. You know, you you can sort of end up, I I can, I remember at one point I was kind of living in Madrid and working a a full school week. Sorry, I was living in Madrid um, teaching and teaching SALTA um, during the, the week in Barcelona, flying back at the weekend to teach a class in Madrid on Saturday mornings and then oh sort of flying back Sunday, you know, and, and things like that to sort of keep these balance between different things. And it can be very difficult to sort of find, you know, a, a job that gives you those other opportunities to do other things. Right. I think, you know, for me, I was quite lucky in that, you know, I was working for the British Council and, and you know, at, at that time, quite a lot of different opportunities used to come up. So I got the opportunity to sort of uh, become a, a coordinator on a CD-ROM project and, and sort of manage a team of writers. And, and I managed to get a sort of 50% contract to sort of do some teaching and to do that at the same time, okay. you know, and that's, that was very lucky, you know, and I worked with some great guys on that and sort of learned a lot from doing that. But, you know, those opportunities aren't, you know, always available, but, you know, that I think that's sort of, you know, when we come to the tips, that's one yeah. of the things to, to look out for is to sort of look out for, you know, other opportunities to sort of break down some of your teaching time and sort of take on other responsibilities, yeah. whether it's, sort of, you know, test writing materials writing or or coordinating or something like that yeah that's a it seems like you've touched on a number of points that that many other people that i've spoken to have as well um especially the, the idea of two things uh sort of the financial aspect but also then the the overworking aspect um mm-hmm. and you obviously when you move into i, I imagine it's not only just moving to freelance, but even just taking on extra stuff as well. Um, certain things to consider. Uh, how did you sort of overcome these? I mean, was it simply just finding the right uh, contracts, the right projects to work on? It, and, and then sort of, I imagine you built up your name. Obviously, you, you're, you're, you're quite well established. You know? So, so yeah. it, it, that must have taken quite a while to do. Uh, yeah, it has taken a while. And it, it is difficult. I mean, the first step into sort of going completely freelance is, mm. is you know, is, is, is a big one, you know, and uh, it's, a, it's also a dangerous one. I mean, at the time when I took that step, I'd been working for the British Council. I was a manager of the British Council's Teaching English website and mm. sort of was developing that. And, you know, I'd been doing it for some years and sort of Felt, felt like I wasn't really going anywhere anymore. Right. You know, I was sort of 
hiring con expensive consultants to tell me stuff that I already knew. And I thought, oh, I could be one of those expensive consultants <laughs> instead. <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, I took the step and sort of uh, and jumped. I mean, my advice to anyone who's going to go freelance is, you know, take on as much uh, private work as you can alongside your job for as long as you can and when it becomes torture then drop the job and, and right. move to the freelance so you've got some stuff coming in you know and I guess that's kind of what I did so you know I stepped into sort of a you know 50 percent uh, consultancy contract um, with a with a company that was developing um, language courses in Second Life, which mm. was the kind of 3D world, you know, but at the time, which was very big at the time. So I got some work doing that and sort of other little bits. But for me, the, you know, the most important thing and the thing that you can get started with at any time really was, you know, blogging. You know, I started my own blog and that kind of built up my kind of portfolio of content, if you like, that I could show people, well, this is what I do. You know, and um, I, I still find that, you know, most of the work I get really, you know, comes to me as a result of the work that I put out there for free. Right. You know, things like blogging, producing videos and things like that. I know that, you know, most of the time, if I have to go to this CV stage of writing an application and, you know, talking about myself and trying to sell myself, you know, most of the time I don't get the job, you know. Yeah. And uh, whereas, you know, most of the good work that I get comes to me because, you know, people have seen something that I've done, people have, you know, writ read something that I've written or yeah, and yeah. things like that. And it's building up enough of that content so that, you know, you're out there and keeping it sort of keeping it sort of keeping you know keep feeding the beast as well yeah. because you know when you stop feeding the beast people forget about you pretty quickly and you know mm. they can move on to somebody else so you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's feeding that really i loved how you mentioned blogging obviously i started <laughs> from from a blog right um, yeah. and I mean, I mean, your blog has so much. You go on there, and it's just all these links to apps and videos. It's amazing. Um, and I really like what you said, like putting stuff out there for free. Um, and I think, I think a lot of people are, are catching on to that now. I mean, I've spoken to a lot of materials developers, especially. And you go onto <laughs> their blogs, and you know, such as yourself, that but they have, you know, a plethora of materials. You know that, that you can choose from and, and they're brilliantly made you know like they're high, very very high quality um and so i think that's probably a key if you know we're going to get to the advice in, in a sec but if you're looking for yeah. especially for for materials development um if you're looking to move into that maybe that's maybe that's one of the, the key things to do i'm not sure if you'd agree on yeah. On, on on that but uh for me i think that's 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 the key yeah thing. i think that that's definitely the key thing you know to have examples of your work out there that people can see and examples of your best work as well so that <laughs> you know they you, they're going to pick up on it and, and like what you do and that can sort of make things very e much easier to get work than having to constantly pitch yourself all the time you know there's nothing worse than you know some publisher coming to you and wanting you know you to write an example unit uh, which is going to take you a couple of days and then you know maybe you don't get the job at the end right. of it and stuff like that yeah. can be really difficult if you're if you're kind of out there and you're building your reputation and people can see that already that you produce good materials often you can sort of sidestep that or you know and even like i say not even not even have to interview or present the cv people will come to come to you and offer you work and that's yeah. kind of the way around you want it if possible but then yeah i mean you've also apart from just being and the online uh, it was funny because I, I, uh, I, I, I was talking to my my director the other day. I said, oh, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to Nick Beach." He's like, "Oh, Mr. Technology," and then <laughs> so people, people know you as Mr. Technology. But, uh, but it's interesting because you're also an author. I mean, you have, mm -hmm. uh, you have, you know, various books out as well. What was the yeah. why? Obviously, you have your your blog, your online stuff. You already have your profile. Why, why write books? What, what's the? Was it just to to get more ideas out there? Um, it, I guess, it, you know, it's, it's for passive income in a way, or I thought it would be passive income. You know, I, I wrote the blog and was writing blog posts and things like that, which is fine, but it's, you know, you know, it's bringing in work, but, you know, 
the problem with work is when you stop doing it, you stop getting paid. Right. So, you know, if you want to have a holiday as a freelancer, you want to take the weekend off, you want to bank holiday Monday, you know, what happens on those things? You know, you can take them, but you're not getting paid anything. So I thought yeah. I needed some passive income. And at the time, you know, I wanted to, to write a digital book. Um, at the, and the time that I was sort of thinking about this was kind of, there was this perfect storm for me, you know, I, 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 Apple had just launched, you know, the, the iPad. Um, they'd also sort of la- launched iTunes Store, which you could put books onto and, you wow. know, that overcome the problems of, you know, getting payments and taking payments. And it was also multimedia. So I thought, great, you know, it's the chance to really write a multimedia book with sort of videos and tutorials and all mm. this kind of thing. And I can do it myself. I don't need a publisher. Um, and the other thing that was happening around that time was the sort of the, the sort of crowdfunding sort of thing kicked off with Kickstarter, mm. where you could actually raise money to do a project. So I, I set up a project, I actually set it up on Indiegogo and raised about you know, five thousand pounds to to write my first book. Wow. You now, which I thought would take me about three months, you know. So I thought five thousand pounds can have three months off write the book, develop the videos for it, you know, publish it through um, iBookstore. It's available then on the iPad. It's going to be amazing, you know, and uh, that was the theory. Um, <laughs> you know, it took, took, actually took me about a year to finish. The Whoa. Book. <laughs> it, it, it ran up to sort of 400 pages and then I had to, I had to cut some, some to get it down to 400 pages. Um, there was something like 30 video tutorials in it and stuff like that. Wow. And I, I kind of really kind of, you know, it was a beast that I, I finally got sort of published. And, um, and really, I, I think the only reason I got it finished was all these people had given me their money and put their trust in me, which is what happens when you, 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 you fund a crowdfund. So, you know, I felt this sort of really heavy obligation to get it finished, which I did and then sort of published it to sort of the iBookstore and uh, entered it for the Innovations Award. And it won the 2016 Innovations Award. Um, which was great, you know, and uh, so, I mean, that that was why books, but I assumed it would be a passive income, you know, mm. I thought my book's out there, I'll make it really cheap, I think I sort of made it, you know, under $5 for this 400 page book, you know, and, you know, I found that after the first month, you know, I just wasn't making any sales. Right. You know? <laughs> And even, you know, so I'd made about, I'd raised £5,000, which was great to write the book. But after publishing it, I think, you know, the first sort of two, three months, I about, made about £150. And, I thought, wow. well, you know, <laughs> and then it was going down all the time. Even, you know, even after it won the Innovations Award, I thought, oh, great. You know, at last, this book is going to start making me some money. But I think the, the week after I won the, the award, it actually sold 10 copies, which was like, so, you know, what do I do now? So I thought, yeah, I have to write more. There we go. Um, but I thought, well, I can't spend a year on each book because that's mm. going to take me, you know, the next 20 years to sort of provide some reasonable income. So, you know, I started sort of looking into um, iterative, iterative design and sort of designing smaller scales. So I started, you know, publishing just lesson plans and just publishing small books and building them up into bigger units and, uh, you know, and and that sort of really take, took off. So now I've got about a uh, hundred different products that you know are out there on my on my um, on my sort of online shop on Payhip, and and so that kind of now that sort of brings in a sort of reasonable amount of money each month as long as I keep pushing it and marketing it and yeah. uh, you know, and building up the, the customer list. I think you've just touched on something that we uh, that I don't think I've I've spoken about in depth with with anyone else before, and it's this idea that if you are going to go freelance, you need to have you know this this idea of not only your your the stuff that you're working on, but this what thinking about the future sort of perspective, yeah. that financial perspective there. Um, and I think that, like you said, you said it's dangerous. It can be dangerous to be a freelance, and, and I think that's probably yeah. one of the the pitfalls that many people fall into, perhaps. Yeah. 
It's it's very easy to, you know, things can be cruising along fine. You're getting loads of work, you know, you're doing great. And all of a sudden, for, for no reason, you know, your work just falls off the end of a cliff and, and nothing happens. This has happened to me once, actually, you know, it, it, at a, a very awkward time as well. You know, I was doing great. I was making good money, had plenty of work coming in. I'd, I'd uh, you know, published the book and... You know, for some reason, you know, I took some time off to, to write the book. And for some reason, you know, a, a project that I was due to work on fell through. Mm. Um, I thought, oh, no problem. Something else will come along. And it just didn't. I just signed up for a mortgage on a, on a house that I was oh. moving into. Uh, my wife was pregnant. And all of a sudden, you know, I had sort of no income, you know, in this uh, for a whole, I went for a whole month with, with sort of no money coming in and started to panic. And, and then, you know, in the end, I went out and got a job. And uh, so Jeez. I sort of went back to working for a company for a couple of years and, and sort of till I sort of, you know, got through things again. Yeah. It, as it turned out, you know, it was a really interesting company to work for. I learned a lot there. Yeah. And, you know, that experience I've sort of taken back, you know, to my freelance work again now. And, and you know, and it's one of the things that I learned from about, you know, you need this passive income. You need, yeah. you know, something to put your time into and to sort of build up, you know, in case, you know, things go wrong or, you know, yeah. or you know, even for a pension sometime, you know, most English language teachers, they move around from school to school, often living abroad, you know. You no know, pension. Yeah. Lots don't have any kind of pension or, or yeah. any kind of security blanket beyond, you know, their ability to work every day. Yeah, it's definitely something uh, that, that freelancers especially need to, need to think of. Um, I suppose that's one of the other things, you know, that, that, oh, it's just one of those things that you don't really think about thinking about the future you just think i just need to get work so i can work now right mm -hmm. um okay i did have a question that was in my mind but i've just it's just totally gone now um i suppose okay so let's 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 shift to our advice i'd like to look at uh, perhaps three different areas advice for teachers that would like to move into teacher training advice for teachers that would like to move into materials development I'm not saying just teachers, EOT professionals, because, you know, you know mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've chatted to, to publishers or, or writers before, uh, but also for those, and we've kind of touched on this already, those are those looking seriously to move into freelancing. Um, if you had to choose maybe one or two pieces of advice for these three, what, what would you say? Um, I guess for the first ones, for the teachers who want to get into teach training, mm. um, you know, find a school that that does it and and be keen. You know, I think I, I, that's the, what happened with me. I, I went to work in International House in Barcelona. They were doing lots of Amazing. courses, yeah. and you know, you just show show willing. And and in the end, what I did to get trained up as a trainer, I offered to sort of shadow courses in my own time. So you know, I had to sort of take a fifty percent contract. I shadowed some courses and 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 that's how I got trained up but you know offered to do a session you know uh, build up your portfolio of teacher training speak at conferences if you can you know and get into it that way you know if, if it helps you know all of these things you know speaking at conferences you know offering to do sessions offering to do teacher development sessions within your school you know being somebody building yourself up as somebody who can't who other teachers come to in the staff room for ideas can really help you know and share as much of your ideas as you can I think there's there's often this this very sort of I don't know if, if this is fair to say but teachers can become a bit competitive you know and and sort of keep their ideas hidden and and you know this is my great idea I want to use it in my class but you find the, uh, you know, creativity is like a muscle. The more you use it, the more you develop it. And by sharing things and getting them out there, you know, you get ideas from other people as well. And you kind of, you'll, you'll have new ideas and you'll have better ideas the more you share. Yeah. And I think that's important. And that's what will build up your profile as somebody who's suitable for teacher training. Right. Before we move on to material, if I can, sorry to interrupt, Nick. Yeah, um, do. How... And I, I, I totally forgot to ask you this before. How much um, of an impact or how much of an impact, uh, yeah, how much of an impact did sorry, doing the diploma have on you as a teacher? And do you think doing the diploma, 
I'm going to say is a prerequisite, even though I don't think it's a prerequisite, but do you think it's a good stepping stone uh, for moving into training? Yeah, I think it is a very good stepping stone, especially if you're thinking about doing sort of cell to type training, right. you know, I think then it's essential, mm -hmm. you know, and I think for me, it was, it, it had sort of a big impact on me doing the Delta. I'd, I'd done Celta, I'd been teaching for a few years, you know, I was feeling very stale. Um, and, you know, I, I did started doing the diploma and it really reinvigorated my teaching. Right. You know, I'm not saying it wasn't hard because it was hard. Right. You know, anyone who does it knows that it's, it's not a great pleasure to do, but it had, to <laughs> me, it had a great impact and, and sort of really invigorated my teaching. And that side of it, I kind of really enjoyed, you know. Right. I know people who, for whom it's, it's had the opposite effect, that they've been really enthusiastic about their teaching, they've done it, and it's kind of thought it's made them sort of, you know, Mm. reassess themselves and thinking actually i'm not very good at this and this isn't right. for me kind of thing yeah. but, but for me it kind of re, really reinvigorated my teaching and i think you know having that to that knowledge base to fall back on and and was really essential for sort of going on into celta you know yeah. and celta training and so i think it does really help you know yeah i think i think and it shows you're constantly developing as well you know so, exactly yeah i think um it is a I mean, I, I do believe now it is a prerequisite for to become a soldier or a cert TSO trainer. Yeah. Um, but but apart from that, I think also if you're moving to training and you're going to be you, you're going to be asked to be critical of other teachers, um, I do think it's important that you've learned to be critical of your own teaching and and, yeah. and 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 aware of that, which is which is quite difficult to I think to develop alone. I'm not going to say impossible, yeah, um, mm. because there are some brilliant teachers that engage you know in reflection and they, and they haven't done a delta or, or a diptiso um but but i do think that it's a good step in in to be being critical of of your own teaching um okay uh, materials development uh you are super into that advice for for teachers that are like oh maybe i want to dabble in that yeah, I think I think the blog blog is one of the big things that I'd recommend. Not just because it sort of gets you out there and sort of puts your materials out there, but if you, by starting to write and produce things for an audience, you know, on a regular basis, it also really hones your skills. You know, mm -hmm. you start to really think about you know um, the way you're writing and the way you're making it understandable to other people. Yeah. You know, it's it's one thing to sort of you know write your own lesson plans and write your own materials for you to deliver in your classroom, but when you have to make those understandable for somebody else to deliver in their classroom, that's a very different discipline. And sort of putting materials out materials out on a blog can can sort of help you sort of refine and develop that discipline you know do it as regularly as you can you know and you know look out for comments from people make sure people understand them get some feedback from your readers can really help you develop yourself as a professional you know? yeah. so i think that's important the other thing i guess is to sort of look around there at the the various sort of publisher sites and you know whether they're recruiting um you know you it isn't just a matter of sort of getting into materials writing by doing writing. You might be able to get taken on as a reviewer. Right. Um, often publishers are looking for people to sort of test books out in the classroom and give them feedback or, or kind of review books. You know, that's a good sort of way in because it gets you to look at materials with a critical eye. You know, becoming parts of materials writers groups as well. There's some good groups on Facebook or, or through our tackle where you can sort of, you know, mix with, with other writers, you know, and pick up hints from there. Yeah, that's, uh, but, I, I, sorry, Nick, continue. No, but the blog, I, I, I definitely remember, recommend the blog. I think that's a really sort of strong thing for a number of reasons. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm presenting it um, at Innovate um, this year, it's, it's next Friday next Friday in one week. Uh, and my, my talk is on, you know, why teachers should get into the blogosphere. Um, and uh, the idea is, is that I think, you know, one aspect is the development side, because it does force you, I mean, writing itself is its own sort of reflective tool. Um, and the fact that people are going to read it makes you really think about, oh, yeah. when, okay. you, when you click that publish button, you have to sort of think very carefully before that. Yeah, yeah. Is this really what I believe? You know, do, do I really want to put this out there as representing myself? Because, yeah. You know, you, 
they say you can, you know, okay, you can take it offline, but once something's out there, really, you know, on the internet, it's out there forever. You know, somebody's seen it, somebody's read about it, somebody's got a screenshot of it. You know, there's your your digital footprint remains eternally. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's scary. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, so I, mean, I suppose that's the development aspect, but also the 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 employment. One of my other points I'm trying mm-hmm. to push is that it, I I do think in in today's era, if you will. Um, having that blog out there is, is one surefire way of, you know, separating yourself away from, from in, in job interviews, you know, putting yourself out there and, yeah. and, re- and really highlighting that. And if for materials yeah. development, I think it's perhaps one of the most yeah. important things now. Also, you know, that aspect of sort of building up an audience, if you build a considerable audience for your blog, you know, that, that becomes marketable as well. Right. You know, you know, often I get offered money to write blog reviews and publish them on my blog, or I get offered money to write, you know, articles for other people's blogs or other people's websites because of that. You know, it isn't just, you know, okay, I put my blog together and that's a route into sort of the big ELT publishers. They'll pick me up and ask, ask me to write a course book. Mm-hmm. In fact, you might you might find that you can get sort of work, you know, writing blog posts for other people or, you know, and and or you know being paid to write your own blog because there is money knocking around in that. And yeah. increasingly there's going, going to be more money in that, particularly as, you know, more, more advertising moves in, in online, right. you know, TV, print become less effective. You know, big expensive influencers aren't, are too expensive for most companies. There's a lot of small companies looking around for somebody, you know, to write for them or to publish something on their blog for them. So if you have an audience... No, that's 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 worth money. That's a good point. I think you've just given me extra things for my presentation. Thank you, Nick. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> the last uh, point for advice would be freelancing. Um, we've kind of touched on some things uh, already. Um, obviously, you have your own sort of consultancy. Like it's more than just uh, you doing it. It's sort of it's a business for you now. Um, but any any other advice or any tips that you would give to people that are looking to make that move? Um, yeah, I mean, like I said before, build up as much freelance work as you can before you step in out, out of your day job and into doing it full time. Uh, have a supportive partner who, who understands when you're not bringing in as much money as they are, or, <laughs> you know, or, you know, some kind of uh, money put put by for a rainy day just in case yeah um i mean one of the other things that actually one of one one good piece of advice that i'll get give you i think and it runs contrary to some of the other things that i've said about sort of putting stuff out there for free but you know that you you'll get offered lots of different kinds of work you'll get offered free work you know that people will say oh well do this for me for free you'll get some exposure you know maybe you'll think you know Get something will come of it but you know what i found is you know whenever you do free work you'll get more free work from it right <laughs> if you do if you do well paid work and you do it well you'll get more well paid work from it so Good you know point. be sure not to undervalue yourself you know mm-hmm. it's great to have exposure but i think it's dorothy dorothy z mark said you can actually die of exposure you know, right. you can't bank it, you know, you, you can't eat it, you know. So, you know, doing free work, think very carefully if you're offered stuff for, to, to, that somebody wants you to do for free. You know, you're, you're a freelance, you're not free. You know? I like that, and I like that. That's good. what you do. You know? <laughs> because doing, doing good, good work and doing it well, doing well-paid work will always lead to more work too. So why do the free work, which will only lead to more free work? Exactly. No, that, that's a good point. Um, I haven't actually uh, done too much. Free- I have done some free- freelance work, but that's because I've I've secured, like for example, with my with my role as a trainer for for Cambridge, mm-hmm. um, I've secured more work through Cambridge because of that. And that was actually that started because of the blog. Um, so that, that 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 was quite good. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I I do remember speaking to it to another trainer recently, and she was offered to to run a session for free you know and she said what i i have a fee and then they said no you know so there are there's there needs to be a line so you know sometimes right especially if you're putting a lot of work into it um yeah okay uh right now i i think we touched on this question before um 
but I'll ask you again, maybe if there's anything uh, else that comes up. And it's sort of language teaching now and tech in the future. Maybe we're looking five years or, or, or 10 years into the future. Um, do you see like big changes, AI, VR? I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I think artificial intelligence will have, you know, will grow and become increasingly used in, in language teaching. Things like, you know, chatbots that you can, you, students can practice talking to and they will respond to them like a, a real person, you right. know, which is great for practice. I think AI in terms of, you know, um, online le learning and, and sort of studying anything online collects awful lots of data, you know, about yeah. the different people. And I think AI can be used to sort of analyze that data very quickly and give you kind of genuine insights into what's happening with those people. So that can save teachers a lot of time in sort of digging around in data, which is, you know, not something most teachers are practicing. Are, are, are trained to do. Right. So I think sort of AI, AI can have impacts like that. You know, I think, you know, the, the sort of virtual reality thing as well or, and augmented reality, I think, will grow. You know, I think I'm particularly interested in augmented reality, reality rather than virtual reality in which, you know, you can go out into the real world and interact with your environment and, yes, and the in right. Internet based on, you know, where you are and location. So, you know, you can walk around and, and point your phone or your, your glasses at a tree and, and access information about that tree kind of thing. And, cool. and I think that within education, I think is going to grow. And with and particularly within, you know, that's going to become big within marketing as well. Oh, um, but, yeah. but um, you know, but I, I still think, you know, if you want to use a language to sit down and have a conversation with a person, that, you know, the best way to practice that is by sitting down with the person and having a conversation. Yes. So, you know, I think there's still sort of room, you know, there's going to be more things and it's going to be broad now, you know, in terms of what you can do to learn a language, but these yeah. still, these things will still remain, you know, it's still really nice to have a teacher who's willing to kick your ass when you don't do your homework. Yeah. Because, you know, such a big thing is, sort of, you know, motivation and having somebody to drive you along, having somebody, you know, there to tell you, you know, I believe in you, you can do it, you know, kind of thing. Those things you can't really, you know, having a robot or, or an AI avatar saying, I believe in you, you know, does it doesn't, doesn't, really, doesn't really cut yeah. it with you, you know. <laughs> No, that you don't. That's just your program telling you. You know, if it's a real person, it's very different. You know? Yeah, actually, that's a good so, one. I've I've yeah. never I've never thought of that before. Like, obviously, I've thought of the the idea of um, sort of being able to speak to something and then it speaks to you. But the idea of mm -hmm. motivation, how you know, I read yeah. Dornier's book uh, some some time ago, and, and he looks at the teacher as you know one of the most important aspects in terms of motivation, and it's that it's the motivation to say you know you did well or you need yeah. to improve which is which is a really important thing to, to take into consideration yeah. I, think. You know, that, I think that element of empathy you know feeling empathy with your students and, yeah. and feeling that somebody has empathy for you you know really really important you know the, the kind of the things that really make us human and are the things that are most valuable to us as teachers I think completely agree yeah Okay, last question, last section of uh, the sponge chat, uh, and then I'll let you get to your your Friday night, which I'm sure you have so many things, beers or something, um, is book recommendations. Um, um, do you have any, apart from your own? <laughs> uh, no, just my own. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, for, in terms of my own, I've written a book called Digital T Tools for Teachers, which has a trainer's edition, which if you're really? interested in tech and training, then that might be useful for you. Um, I've also written uh, a book on creativity called Hacking Creativity, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it, it, I mean, it uses some technology, but it isn't about technology. It's about, you know, being creative and, and doing creative things in the classroom with your students. Yeah. Um, uh, books in terms of teacher training, uh, I have to delve back a long way into to my teacher training days now to um, sort of look, looking at my shelves, seeing what's on there. You know, I think, you know, I, I think Martin Parrott wrote a very good book on for teacher training. 
uh, I can't remember what it's called. And there's the Scott Thornberry's about language, I guess, I think, which I is think one of the. A task for language teachers, maybe for Martin Parrott. That, that, oh, there you go. That's, there we go. That's, there there we it go. is. And what yeah. a coincidence. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I found that very good. Um, you know, uh, as I said, Scott Thornbury is about language, you know, yeah. very good as well um, in terms of teacher training. In, t in terms of teaching, you know, one of my favourite books was actually uh, Mario Rinvalucri's Challenge to Think. Challenge and I think, to think. I haven't you know, heard of this book. Yeah, there's a, a book called Challenge to Think. I've probably got two copies of it knocking about here somewhere, one with right. the, out even a cover. And I think... Um, you know, that's that's a good one in terms of, you know, getting away from just thinking of yourself as a language teacher who teaches bits of language. Right. But often as language teachers, we think our role is there to teach students structures, yeah. vocabulary, grammar, whereas challenge to think does literally what it says. It challenges students to, to think about things and they use language in the process of doing that, right. which I think is, is great. You know, it's a great book. Another one by Mario Rim for Lucre was uh, Once Upon a Time, which is a sort of book about um, how to use stories in, in um, language development. And it has lots of very short story activities and things like that, which I love. I've always loved doing with students. Brilliant. Um, in terms of teaching, the other one I thought of, which which isn't really a teacher training book, but I have a copy of it here. Ah. It's a very good book called Emotional Intelligence Coaching. And oh. I think this is something that's kind of often neglected. It's by Stephen Neal and Liz Spencer Arnell and Liz Wilson. And um, I think, you know, Getting into coaching and understanding emotional intelligence can be really useful for teachers and teacher trainers. Yeah. You know, and uh, kind of that looks at, you know, how to sort of build motivation and, and, and uh, you use these different techniques to sort of um, put, help, help train learners, whether it's trainee teachers or whether it's language students, take yeah. control of their own learning and take responsibility for their own learning. So I think that's well worth getting into if you're Brilliant. into that kind of thing. I mean, you, you've just but, mentioned some, some, some massive, I mean, that one there is very, very interesting. Um, I, I really yeah. like how, you know, I've spoken to a number of um, you know, EOC professionals with this. And one interesting thing that, that comes up with a lot of us is, is we're looking for insights that are not just focused on language teaching. It's interesting. Yeah. That sometimes I find myself I'm reading or I'm looking through the books I'm going to read. I come on list like a, they're all focused on language teaching, and mm -hmm. it's sometimes interesting to read something else that it could be for mainstream education yeah. or, or something else. But that, that usually quite a lot of insights that could be brought into saying. I mean, with with technology, I imagine this is very much the yeah. case. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean. I, I read. I, I don't read much by teachers who use technology. I read about technology and yeah. technology <laughs> blogs, and sort of think about you know what from that can be used in teaching. You know, Brilliant. but but so the the more you look outside, you know, looking into sort of theories of creativity you know, and uh, developing soft skills, I found really interesting. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been kind of really lucky in in that in some of the jobs that I've done and some of the, the work that I've taken on is sort of taking me into sort of different, different avenues. You know, I worked for a while with Eton College developing soft, online soft skills courses for them and sort of learned a lot from the content that I was working with. You know, mm. I recently did a course with um, British Council in Cairo and Al Hazar University on interfaith dialogue, right. which was really interesting and sort of looking at how you can sort of develop the skills of building dialogue and of which sort of um, avoids confrontation and in, in, in avoids kind of head to head confrontation and arguing, but, you know, helps people to understand each other. And there's so much that you can take from that for the language teaching and for teacher training as well, or even for your personal life as well. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's a great thing. So, yeah, no, definitely. Well, Nick, uh, you have been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank oh, thank you very you. much for, for taking the time out to, to, to speak with to me and with the rest of the world. Um, this has been really, really insightful. Um, and I have no doubt that it's going to help teachers around the world uh, see that there is more out there. It's not just <laughs> moving to the classroom and that. 
And I, I do hope it, in, it encourages people to, to, you know, reconsider their perspective of, of, of our sector. Um, and, and yeah, um, so I will let you go, uh, but I do hope that we get to speak again, perhaps on another sponge chat in the future. And, uh, and yeah. For sure. And maybe even physically face to face one day, who knows? Who knows? If those things ever start again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would be absolutely amazing. All right, All right Nick, okay. we'll take care, okay? Okay. Thanks very much. It's great speaking to you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.